and went to uh, uh, Camp Grant, Rockford, Illinois, which was a basic kind of a camp. I was there maybe three or four days and then shipped on to Camp Campbell, Kentucky, and then spent perhaps a better part of a year or so before being transferred via an Arkansas camp, pick up some vehicles, and then went to uh, uh, Camp Barkley, Texas. So I don't have much to say about crossing the Atlantic because I was on KP. I did a lot of KP work. Tank drivers were not considered special people, you know. <laughs> they, they drove tanks or they were on KP. Hmm. Though I had heard from one other guy who served some KP on the ship going across the Atlantic, that was pretty good duty to have. Yes, it was. Yes, because we always had something to eat and maybe some little extras. But uh, uh, so that wasn't much of an experience there. But we crossed the English Channel uh, uh, because we were really supposed to go to La Harve, but when we were supposed to land there, why uh, the enemy, the Krauts, had started to bomb the, har the, the harbor. So they uh, detoured us to England, and when you get at a division of 10 or 12,000 people, it takes a while to get them all off the boats and then get them back on, so another 30 days or so was lost. And so we then went overseas finally, and the and, uh, first combat experience was uh, we probably weren't overseas more than uh, uh, 24 hours, and the crowd started to throw artillery in on us. They knew where we were, even if we didn't know where we were. <laughs> so, but I was not captured in any way. We had other people that were captured and wounded. but. Uh, we had uh, this big battle of, of Herlesheim and also the Kulmar Parkett, Pocket. And uh, we, the 12th Armored Division, 92nd Recon, was involved in the race to the Rhine. Uh, actually, we, they pulled us out of the Kulmar Pocket to go to the Battle of the Bulge, where, as you know, they were having a big problem. But fortunately, the, the uh, weather cleared and our Air Force was able to come in and do a great job up there, so they didn't need us uh, up at the Bastogne. So they detoured us to lead the 3rd Army to the Rhine, General Patton's yeah. army. Now tell me a little bit about uh, serving under General Patton. I I've heard people who are on both sides of the fence about this. What was your opinion of working under General Patton as opposed to General Patch? Never having met either of the general, not even seen them, I was in a unit, a recon unit. We would do what we're told. So it didn't make any difference who the general's name was if we didn't get to see him. They rarely, if ever, stopped around our unit and shook hands or say, how are you doing? Uh, even when it came to uh, entertainers coming from uh, this country over to France to entertain the troops, uh, we never got a chance to be entertained. You know, we were too busy, like fighting a war. <laughs> but that's the way it went. So that's where we were involved uh, in the race to the Rhine. Uh, we were involved in the liberation of one of the prisoner of war and concentration camps at Landsberg. That was near the end of the war, probably in uh, March or April. And uh, uh, I remember I was telling my, my family, we pulled up to the gates of this Camp Landsberg and they were people inside were saying, and there were some American POWs in there too, and they said, uh, well, the, the gate is locked and the crowds have left and the guards have left, so I need the keys. Stand out of the way. <laughs> so drove the tank into the gate and blew it off of there and they just ran. They were free. They ran. They didn't know where they were going. So. Uh, by the time the, the uh, war was over, uh, we were in Austria. We were moving that fast, going through Munich, Germany, and uh, other towns prior to Munich and then after Munich and into Austria when we were told that the war was over. So they said, okay, uh, uh, start to move those tanks out of the position you're in and fall back to a town. As soon as we started to move the tanks out, why the Krauts threw shells in on us again. 
and said, let's haul our ass out of here fast. So we did, and nobody got hurt. I said, it'd be terrible to get killed on the last day of the war. <laughs> See, but So uh, we were there in Austria, and uh, after the fighting was over, uh, we were in the Army of Occupation uh, for a period of roughly, say, May and the end of the war, till uh, uh, after they split up the 12th Armored Division, then I was transferred to one or two or three other divisions. And I forget the numbers, but I think it was the second or the third armored. And um, by then when I got to that division, there was somebody hollering my name as a truck pulled up with all of us replacements. And uh, I said, I'm Humbert. And he said, I got a job for you. And if you take this job, I can go home. I said, really? He said, if you'll be the company clerk, I see by your record you have some typing. I said, oh my, that's three or four years ago in high school. I don't care, he said. If you can go like this, you got the job. If you'll take it, there's no KP or guard duty. I said, I'll take it. I've been on enough KP and guard duty. <laughs> see, see, so. so finally then uh, we returned home and I was discharged uh, from Camp Grant where I went into the service. and. Uh, I don't remember too many folks about uh, that I was involved with because we seemed to be moving so fast. The guys that were central to you at the time of our occupation and then after occupation, the same guys, only now we're doing whatever they told us to. And because they knew that the soldier had to be occupied, why they, they got some softballs and bats and, and we had ball games. Can you imagine that? From fighting a war to having a softball game. But that's what they did. I uh, didn't do any interaction with uh, foreign troops, either British or French, or even the German people, because there was uh, a, a non-fraternization uh, situation going on. So uh, they said, uh, you can, can be put in jail or somehow disciplined. So I remember a time when we were going in a column, and uh, I, I noticed a tank in front of me suddenly veer off like this and kind of go into the ditch. And when we checked with him, what had happened is the driver in that tank uh, was shot by his own man sitting alongside of him accidentally. He had gotten a, a German pistol and he was saying, look at isn't this nice, bang, and he shot him in the arms. So that's why he went into the ditch, and that was the end of the war for him, see. And then there was another fella uh, whose name was, uh, was Black, and he had gotten two pearl handle revolvers. He was very proud of them. And uh, we were in column, and he stopped. The column stopped and he jumped out and there were prisoners going by back to there and he jumped out of there and I shot one of them. Never had any explanation why, but within 15 minutes we were then in a little town and uh, uh, his tank was off to the side and he was upstairs at the billet that they were assigned to. And he hollered down and said, hey, will somebody bring up my, my equipment and my uh, sack and so forth? And somebody says, yeah, I'll do it, I'll bring it up. So as this fellow was climbing into the, the tank, he slipped and fell, and fell against a 50 caliber machine gun that went up like this, and boom, boom, two bullets came out of there and killed this guy up in the, up the second story. So that was the end of the war for him. Here he was executing one of the Germans, and 15 minutes later, he was gone. And uh, we had another situation where we were being attacked as our column was moving, and uh, uh, Sergeant Leach was in that head uh, platoon, and they could see where we were being uh, shot at, and when they went up there, uh, the Krauts had left, but there were kids, 14, 15 years old, in, in a foxhole with rifles, and of course they were instructed, better shoot the Americans or they're gonna kill you. So this one fellow was so upset at that, that they used these kids in the war. They took the gun away from this kid and banged it against the tree without clearing the gun. 
shot himself. That was the end of him. Now, we heard that he'd left, gone to the hospital, but we never heard from him after that, so I don't know if he passed away or if he eventually uh, made it. But uh, I'm trying to think of this sudden think of anything else I've said, Alan? Let me look at that list, yeah. As many times as we uh, were in our tanks and moving along and supporting that way, there were several times when I uh, had to park the tanks. I say park, you know, pull them in the field mm -hmm. and get out. Going to go on a patrol. So one of the biggest patrols was the one at Hurlishheim. There were two different troops, and a troop would hold about 120 to 130 men. And there was A troop and D troop was alongside of us. So we had a couple of hundred people in this particular operation going through this big, huge field to Herlesheim. And uh, we got down there, uh, I forgot how far, but it was in the middle of the night, probably two, three o'clock in the morning. And we did come upon the enemy and they started to open fire on us. We had a big firefight there and we were told to retreat. So uh, we did gradually work our way back and uh, and we made it, got back to where this big, uh, like, a, like the, uh, where this big uh, waterworks was, and and uh, uh, this was we had a big medium tank there, and uh, we were glad to see that because that was big confidence to us guys that had our smaller tanks in recon, and so we all stood there and lit up a cigarette. Well, that was like turning on a flashlight. First thing you know, here comes the artillery again from the crowds. So I said, what's the matter with us? You know, how stupid can you be? This is war. Anyhow, nobody got hurt from that, but we cleared out of there in their hurry too. And uh, I, I think I've probably pretty well covered most of Yeah, how about the time you and Billy Buxton were up on top of a hill and they started shelling you and you ran down, you looked the next morning and you see your footprints in the snow coming down. Yes, that's right. Shortly after we got to the front lines, and uh, this was like the end of November, first part of December of uh, 40, 44, 45, uh, it started to snow. And again, we just just came there to the front line, and the Krauts already are throwing in artillery on us. So we, one of our lieutenants was hit there, and we ran over there. And uh, he was just recently married before he left the States. And he got hit high up on the leg here, see. So we ran over to him and, and he said, tell me it's all there. <laughs> <laughs> so he ripped open the rest of his pants and said, yeah, it's all there. So he said, thank God. So on we went. Well, we went to the end of the town and got more shelling and then went up this hill. And uh, when we got up this hill, then we had more action by the, the enemy. And first thing you know, here comes, they estimated around 200 uh, of the Krauts were coming across. And we could hear their, their mess kit, uh, their equipment rattling. And they were calling out to us. They wanted to surrender. And we thought it was a trap of some kind. And uh, but we told them, we're, we've got all the American guns trained on you. One false move, anybody uh, shoots or whatever, everybody's dead. You know, we understand. So they came through our lines, and uh, we got a bunch of prisoners that day. See, so what did I miss, Alan? You and Billy Buckskin on top of a hill, and you started to get shelled. Next morning, you looked up. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. On the way up the top of that hill, that's right. Uh, it had winter and it had snowed, and uh, they had shelled us. Well, finally, we survived that and got on top of the hill. And then when we looked down the next morning, we could see our footprints all around where the shells hit, and we didn't get hit. I mean, the good Lord was watching out for us. It wasn't time for us to go. And Billy Buckskin, too, he, he was right close to five foot or maybe slightly less. And at that time, the Army said, if you weren't at least five foot, why well, you didn't belong in the Army, and they'd discharge you. Every day he waited for the mail to come to see if he had a letter <laughs> sent to discharge him. Never happened. Never happened. Went through the war. 
and uh, he was from Oklahoma, had oil land over there, and uh, he ultimately passed away only from old age. Native American. Yeah, Native American, that's right. Wow. That pretty much sums it up, I think. How about that, the patrol where um, a German prisoner was giving up, and what the sergeant or whoever stood up, he, he, he kept saying, come over this way, and so uh, the, the German kept walking the wrong way, so he stood up and then he was shot. Yes, yes, that was another, uh, what I say, minimal action. You know, sometimes it didn't take several battalions to fight, you know, it only be, maybe a group of people. Well, we were in a position where we could take on some prisoners, and there were a couple of them coming across a field carrying some kind of a white sheet or blanket. And they said, we come to you, we come to you. So one of our guys said, and I don't know why I remember this fellow's name, have Chester Lubus tell him to come this way. Lubus was from Chicago, where I was from. So he stood up to holler to him, hey, come this way. And as soon as he stood up, they shot him. We didn't take any prisoners that day. So it's called war. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, sir, I want to thank you for taking the time and telling me your story, uh, especially giving me the chance to preserve it for future generations. Thank you, sir. You're welcome.